guys welcome back to the channel and as promised i am bringing you the wooden tarot review i'm super psyched to do this i know that i put a couple of other videos up first but during the time that i was contemplating how i would do this review i had a lot of input from other people who had asked for it about some of the content that they would like to hear and rather than splitting it into two separate videos i've decided to structure it in a specific way for you guys and hopefully that will work for everyone involved so i've worked with this deck and i've owned this deck for a long time therefore this is a review but a few of the requests that i received was could i please tell people as many of the animals and plants and bones that i was able to identify so that it could help them with their connection and also a lot of people have said that in reviews especially when you don't have a walkthrough on your channel they still like to go through the deck in order and as you can see i have popped it back in order for you guys so i have listened because of the walkthrough style what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you the review and have a discussion about the deck and we're also going to quickly go over the oh what's the box like what's the card stock like etc then we're going to change view and then we're going to go through the deck and i'm going to discuss as many of the things that i know and that i can share with you so you're definitely going to get the review you're going to get that first but then we're going to go through the deck and hopefully then that works and everyone can hear whatever it is that they've come to this review for. I've had this deck for maybe three years. I'm really terrible with timing. And when I initially got this deck, I was taken away by the artwork. The creator's name is Andrew Schwartz if you're not familiar with them and their brand name I guess is Skull Garden. Now their art style I cover it. I live and breathe their art. They're another artist that I am obsessed with. I have the Wooden Tarot, I have the Earthbound Oracle and I have their new Pathfinder Oracle on my wish list for when our EU stockist gets it. I would love to learn Lenormand with his deck, but his Lenormand deck is the only one that's not available from an EU stockist. But considering I'm learning other things at the moment, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if it ever comes over here, I would get it. So big love for this creator. And I very quickly fell in love with the artwork. A friend and I ordered it at the same time so that we could study it together. And we did a lot of that and then I continued to study it after. By the time that I'd finished studying the deck, I felt like my connection was still in its infancy other than the art obsession. And I think that that's because I was in a phase when I was really diving into Rider Waite Smith clone-ish decks. What I mean by clone-ish is it's not the exact right away Smith imagery by a different artist, but it is very clearly still right away Smith. Tarot of Pagan Cats is a prime example. And I had chosen to jump into that as someone who came from a really non-traditional background and grew up using the Medicine Woman Tarot. So to me, it made sense to really flesh out my tarot knowledge and go into the right away Smith further which this isn't an easy deck to use for that but what i do love about this deck is it does demand your time and your study and your patience in building that connection before you develop an understanding that's my experience but i hear very commonly that's a lot of people's experiences and i actually think that that's really clever and really valuable in a time when deck collecting and so many decks are available and there's nothing wrong with it i have got many more decks than i used to have but i think that's the interesting thing after only having one tarot deck for a long time it's really fun to branch out into different systems and different artwork but it's a double-edged sword in that maybe some deck connections if they're not more traditional 
take longer and therefore we can become very short-sighted and just use things that are easy, 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 easy. And I like to really expand my knowledge. Don't get me wrong, I love having some easy readers. This is an easy reader for me now, so hopefully this review will help in some capacity anyway. So I had a break from the deck after doing that and I kept it because I knew that I would come back to it. I went through my whole phase and my studies and when I came back, it sparked that fire and this is a very connective deck. It's one that I use regularly for myself. It's one that only very tightly missed out in my top five for Kelly Bear's VR, which if you haven't seen, I'll link above now. And in honesty, in reflection on how, how much of a relationship that I'm building with this deck, even day by day, I would imagine that it's going to fence its way into that for next year. Now, do I think this is a deck for beginners? No, I don't, I'm afraid. However, that doesn't mean a beginner can't use it. As a general, I don't think it's a beginner deck, but I will give my reasons for both. I'm a firm believer that if the art appeals to you and you're willing to do the study, then you will connect with the deck. The Wild Unknown was such a big jump from the Medicine Woman Tarot, and that's the jump that I did. And it wasn't even a jump into a solid Rider Waite Smith. And as someone who that's one of their soul decks, I can tell you that when I first got that deck, I still looked at it and was like, huh? But I loved it, and the colours made sense, and the animals made sense. And when I was a bit more patient, I was able to understand the messages. And I mean, that's one of my go-to decks now. So I certainly think that a beginner can start off with any deck that they want and give it the time and the patience and the connection. What I do feel, however, is this isn't going to teach you a system, right away Smith or otherwise. And the reason I say that is not just this deck in particular, but any decks that are more artistically unique, that are more obscure or non-traditional, especially mixed with that spacious imagery, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult for people. One of the things that I would say is if animals and nature don't speak to you and they're not at least a part of your practice, then it's doubtful that this particular deck is gonna be for you, in my opinion, but you may still enjoy the imagery. Now, the creator's artwork it is very intentional and you'll realise as we go through it, the bones are animal bones, I think. There may be some people bones in there, but predominantly animal bones, if not all animal bones. There, the moon is used, the sun is used, various plants, different birds, it all adds to the layers of the meanings. And for someone like myself who, my garden and some of the local woods and ponds and forests, they feel like my altar. Uh, not mine alone, obviously we share them, not just mine. But that speaks more to me than this little setup that you see. This doesn't represent too much of my practice. Whereas the elements and the animals, they're a big part of my life. Animal medicine is a big deal to me and therefore diving into this deck and giving it time was something that I was willing to do and something that I was excited to do because I'm a nerd. And basically what I'm saying is the artwork sits well with my soul and it's kind of how I envision my world. I'm not saying I don't like humans. <laughs> what I'm saying is I love nature and I love animals and I like the, the slight obscurity that's added in there, you know, the extra eyeballs, if you don't like things like that, again, not a deck for you. But there's almost a touch of my dreamscape and how I dream intertwined in this deck, so it's really delightful for me. I'm also a firm believer that most decks will read for anything, but I think that that's a very personal taste. And when I read for other people, I will generally offer them at least a selection of decks because I think I just come at it in a different experience and I will just use this for anything. So I'm not a really 
a good example I guess of what type of deck this is for I can only tell you that I read it for everything without going further into the cards that's my review and my experience of the deck along the way so hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight and of course we'll discuss as we go but the focus is going to be a lot more on what we're seeing in the cards one of the things that I would like to add is that when I did a lot of my studying of the deck I, I, I mistakenly didn't use the internet very much until maybe the second half it's a shame because had I have used the internet sooner there's a lot of blogs and websites and groups and stuff out there that would have done a lot of the footwork for me but I actually had a lot of fun trying to work out what various things were in this deck now obviously there's the potential that I'm going to be wrong in some of what I tell you so please just don't take it verbatim but I have looked into it a lot and so have these blogs and therefore I'm going to link two of the main blogs below because they are wonderful and what a fantastic resource that's available to all of us. Let's get on to the few little bits about the deck and the card stock and all that jazz before we jump into the cards. One of the things that I really appreciate about the Skull Garden decks is that they are really, really durable. They're actually a really underrated cardstock, 300 GSM, super flexible, but really, really durable and really affordable. These decks for indie decks are amazingly affordable and I really thank the creator for that. So just to give you a close up, it's traditional tarot sized and you can see, can we catch the satin? There we go. It's gorgeous to hold, to shuffle. I don't rifle shuffle, but as I said, I would imagine that I've got two cards there as well. I would imagine that they do really well. It's got reversible backs and it is a 79 card deck. 78 traditional and then which the card is out of the deck at the moment. A little happy squirrel, which I'll still discuss. Aesthetically, these were coloured from what I understand, or painted rather, on gorgeous wooden... What's the word? I feel like canvas isn't the right word, but we're going to roll with it, people. So you can see that whilst the backs are all of the same, because it's the same, it's the same picture, we get these really earthy, various tones of the wood and all of the texture involved. And then you can see the grey ones sticking out. Those are actually the aces and they really stick out quite beautifully. And because they really pull on their elements, it's a lovely addition. So, you know, for us who do like to gush at the aesthetics, it's so pretty. And finally, it comes with a really pretty and it's done really well, this tuck box. I actually have another deck in it. I think this is my Animism Tarot. Yep. <laughs> now, I use this deck regularly as well. And the reason that I have it in this box is because this is such a good box. Because it's got the addition of this. So when you open it, it's actually really easy to get them out. The animism is thinner than the wooden tarot, but it's still really easy. It's aesthetically pleasing again. The more of a sort of glossy sheen is probably what's actually kept it so well. And my copy of the deck, it sits out in this lovely wooden tarot creation by the same creator, Copper Moon, who did this. And so I've got the Wooden Tarot, both of my Brian Froud Fairy Oracles and the Earthbound Oracle all sit in there for me really easy to access, which is what I like because I love using this deck. So for anyone who's wondering what they're going to get when they buy it, that's all of the insight. It doesn't come with any form of a book, no PDF, no little white book, which is why the blogs exist, it's why the groups exist, it's why it was so heavily requested of me that I discuss the animals and the symbology because you don't get any of that information and 
at one point I thought that the creator was maybe planning on doing it and then I'm not so sure now who knows but I think by this stage a lot of us who have studied it can hopefully help you guys out as you can see I've changed the camera angle a little it's actually a couple of days later because I lost lighting the angle is going to help me go through the deck more than anything it's not particularly for you guys but my hands are sore at the moment and it makes it easier but it will give you a nice close-up of the cards really what I was asked is can you tell us what we're looking at whilst I have identified as much as I can half of which I've done myself. As I say, half of the identifications I've actually been supported by some amazing blogs. We're not the creator. Just remember that there's a possibility that I am wrong or that the blogs are wrong. We've done as well as we can to research this and you can always then look into it further once you've kind of got an idea of what you're looking at. This is actually separate from the deck because this got stained. It is the additional card, so I will show it to you. It's the Happy Squirrel card. So it's a 79 card deck. And if you're not familiar with a Happy Squirrel, if you go on Google and you type in Happy Squirrel Simpsons, then you will see what birthed the Happy Squirrel and it will give you kind of an understanding. The only reason that I don't use this in my deck is because I'm worried that the orange stain will come off on the front of another card because I did used to use it. Go and research it and see how that works for you because I don't really want to sway anyone's opinion of this card. It's quite a fun one and you can see there's a couple of little symbols here for you to jump off on. Now, into the 78, we start with a full, and what I believe to be a deer mouse. It's possible that it's a different kind of mouse, and when I've gone through identification, I've chose animals that, obviously the representation, but also that are likely to be native to the creator. They've got a little lotus blossom here, we've got the sun shining, and they're walking along what appears to be a python. As I say, I'm not going to discuss all of the cards and how it fits with a meaning, but you get the whole fool's journey here, the potential for transformation with a snake, the potential for danger, because, you know, snakes think mice are yummy. <laughs> then we move into the magician, which has got the infinity symbol again. I appreciate that there's another name for this, and I don't remember it, but... You know what it is, hopefully, by now. And we have a Lunar Moth. We've got this gorgeous whale in the High Priestess with the three phases of the moon. And I think that this is a blue whale. Of course, in Skull Garden, part of the artistic styling is that things have got extra legs and extra eyes. And that's something that I personally enjoy. Sometimes it's made things a tiny bit harder to identify, but as a general rule, it's been pretty easy. Here are the Empress and Emperor. Now, I didn't try and guess what kind of elephants they were. <laughs> They're elephants. You've got the elemental signs here as well for water and fire. And I love that the creator has made these two the same. I enjoy that index, you know, the wild unknown's got both of the trees. I like how the two talk to each other in that capacity. And we've got a couple of symbols here that we would usually see on the Rider Waite Smith. Here with the Emperor, the bit above the elephant looks much more like mountains, you know, strong and structured, but not necessarily lush, more stark in their appearance. And then we've got the forest for the Emperor. Uh, the Empress, so much more sort of greenery. This one, the Hierophant, had me at a cross between either... I originally thought it was a mule deer. It could possibly be a white-tailed deer otherwise. There are white-tailed deer in the deck, at least if I'm right. And uh, they look a little bit different, so maybe mule, maybe white-tailed. But I love the growth around them, and I like the balance of the two keys and the roses. And again, we've got the sun. The sun and the moon are used loads in this deck, which I really appreciate. Now, the lovers, there you can see, we've got a two-headed hummingbird. 
which is adorable. If you don't like anatomical hearts and bones and such, as I said before, especially with the eyeballs as well, then you're probably not watching this, but just in case, there's a lot of it in this deck. I didn't ID the snail either. It kind of reminds me of one of my old giant African land snails. And I think the snail was a really, really interesting one for a lot of people because often the chariot is expressed visually in maybe a bit more of a faster or a assertive or sometimes not negatively aggressive, but a very sort of passionate, fiery, quick energy. But I like the snail for the chariot and the idea of carrying their home with them, carrying their lessons, carrying their journey and the commitment to the pace that snails give. Because if they want to get from A to B, they have really got to be committed. And that was just a layer that I personally added on. I think, I think, I think, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of I thinks in this. That this is a green rhino beetle. And then also to add, we've got something that appears to be an infinity symbol. And here we've got a diamond. And as most people will know, diamonds are very strong. So all of that put together works really well for the strength. Then we've got the really cute hermit who is, it's like the forest is wrapped around them which I love and you can see that actually it appears to be that they're blind. Now I could be totally reading that wrong but I'm not the only person that said that and I was thinking about going within and having to connect with your other senses because of that. So it was just something that I was pondering and obviously with them wrapped in the forest you know it's sort of speaking to the fact that bears hibernate or rather a lot of them it's called torpor and I think this is a grizzly bear. For those who don't like spiders there is a spider and it's got lots of eyeballs. <laughs> I don't do warnings because I'd be here forever. Um, again I didn't ID the spider but it's a beautiful Wheel of Fortune. I've seen the spider's web be used a couple of times for this and I feel like it works really well. Plus the cyclical nature of the ups and downs that happen in a spider web. You know, every time something dies and or gets caught and is killed rather in the spider web, it's bad for them and good for the spider. And if the spider doesn't catch anything, it's bad for the spider. And of course, the nature of them having to repair their webs and move their webs. So a bit of an interesting one. We've got the blindfolded hawk here and we've got the balance between the crystals and the feathers. Now again, hawk wise, possibly a red tailed, possibly a cooper. I don't know. It's not my strong point hawk identification, but they are my two offerings and definitely go and look. Of course, with anything, there's going to be some artistic license. And when you're looking at lots of real photos of animals and comparing them to artwork, sometimes you could be looking at a particularly speckled one of these because that's what I was coming across. The, the hawks that I was looking at, they had more markings underneath. This is a bat. It's a bat, you guys. That's as far as I got with this one. I know that people say sometimes the bats are a little on the nose with a hanged man because obviously this is a different perspective for us, but it's a very normal perspective for the bat. However, the way I look at it is they are encouraging us to see from their perspective. And so we're invited into that energy where, OK, it's their normality, but it's not ours. And also, whilst they do hang upside down, and that is part of their normality, they do still fly upright. It's not like they fly upside down. So it works still, but I know that a few people have said they would like to see a different animal in The Hanged Man. This deck has been around for quite some time, though, in fairness to this deck. Here we've got the death card. And I didn't notice when I first got this, but... <laughs> I thought it was the markings. It's got this cute little 
mouse bottom hanging out because this beautiful owl, which I think is a snowy owl, is having their lunch. So we could see the sun as setting or rising. We've got a black rose here, so using the coloration for part of the energy. And again, we've got the life cycle because for each mouse that dies, another owl is fed. And of course, that is the cycle of life. Is it the fall? Could be, I don't know. Let's hope not because then they can't carry on the journey in this instance. But I guess if you were gonna look at it metaphorically, we could see it as part of the death to the lessons that they've learned so far in getting up to this point. And then the, the latter part of the rebirth that's considered after death. We move into temperance with this gorgeous North American river otter. I'm almost certain that that's what this is at this stage. And a nod to the fact that the otter is both within water and on land. So you've got the mixing of two elements whilst they're not necessarily fire and water. Or you could think of the otter's very fiery, passionate, playful energy, I guess. But I do like the mixing of the two elements with the otter. We've got the devil. It's a devil skull, peeps. <laughs> it's got these spiral horns and then it's got these ram-like horns. And really frustratingly, my friend had found some information on this particular card. And I can't find it anywhere. And I know you guys have been waiting for this review and walkthrough. So... I'm just rolling with it. We've got the tower, we've got the lightning hitting it. Obviously when lightning strikes trees, it can be very destructive, but then growth can occur after and often does. So we move into the star and we've got this really cute firefly holding the little star or at least hovering above it. And then we've got a very plush lotus underneath. The moon has been subject to a lot of discussion. I spent a lot of time looking at skulls and thinking about the symbology and it very quickly became evident to me that this is a wolf skull. Of course, we've got a lot of teetering off and again, artistic interpretation, but I would, I'm not a betting person, but I would place a bet that this is in fact a wolf skull, which would then make sense because we do see the wolf in the moon and there's a lot of animal and symbolic links between the two which works quite nicely because if this is the wolf we then move into the sun and we've got the red fox as a counterpart which is really interesting now the red fox doesn't have a head it has a sunflower for its head but again that fits very nicely with the symbology the rider weight smith and the fact that sunflowers will turn to face the sun so I am pretty certain this is a wolf skull, but if I'm wrong, you're welcome to correct me. Now these are what look like black trumpet mushrooms on the head of, I don't know what. <laughs> Maybe this is just a bird that has formed in the mutation of black trumpet mushrooms, but that's all I can give you for these ones. And I'm pretty certain that's what they are because of course their shape is very recognizable. And finally, we've got the tree of life for the world, which is gorgeous. We've got many of the elements and you can see that we've got a little door opening again at the top as well so that we can walk through and return back into the fool's journey. So really quickly, I'll show you the aces and taking a trick out of Kelly from the Truth in Stories book all together. And the reason being is the names of the suits have been another thing that people have sometimes found a little bit more difficult to get into the swing of. So we've got bones and stones, blooms and plumes. Now, if you look at the aces, which are called the gods, we've got their elements and we've got the bones which are the pentacles as earth and if you see here we've got a very earthy kind of olive green with some browns coming in we've got the stones this is where people get confused because stones earth 
they're actually represented as mostly crystals and antlers. One of the things to remember is when you're seeing the crystals, because they're called stones, they're red. So if you can think of the colour and kind of attach that to the element of fire, which, as I say, when we're talking about wands, for me, wands are fire and swords are air. I appreciate not everyone feels like that. It's quite common to see it that way around in a lot of decks, and that's how it is in the Rider Waite Smith. So if you're comfortable with that, then that will help you with this deck. So every time you see the red, if you think of fire, which we can see the elements are included. So we've got some mountains here. We've got the fire here Move into the blooms, which is our cups. And so we can see the water element around here. And then they're holding a lotus flower. And finally, the plumes, which is our air and our swords suit, which is represented here by a feather. There's lots of birds in there to help with that kind of air energy. So we'll start off with the suit of plumes, a.k.a. the swords. And I did forget to mention the swords, the coloration on this ace is kind of a an orangey yellow. But again, it's easy to differentiate between the more green tones of the bones. It's getting really rhymy up in here. We've got the two here and I think it's pretty at least from my point of view, very easy to connect this with the Two of Swords just because of the infinity symbol. We've got the wing either side and then we've got a waxing crescent, which if you're familiar with the moon phases, then you can add that to your arsenal as well. We've got your very commonly seen Three of Swords and the heart. Need I say much more? We've got what appears to be some arrows piercing it, and it's very anatomically correct. Here for the Four of Plumes, I think that this is a pigeon, and poor little pigeons get such a hard time that this almost reminds me of falling. And it's at that point I wonder if this speaks to if we've waited too long to take that mental rest and then we're kind of maybe we're not mentally prepared enough for something and it catches us off guard or whatever it is but pigeons get quite a bad rap so it fit for me with this card and then you can see that in these they will be represented numerologically somehow so two wings three arrows, four feathers, and it will do that along the way in each card. Here we've got the blue jay in the five of swords with three broken eggs and two remaining. And there's been lots of discussion because blue jays will go and take eggs. They're part of the Corvid family. You know, unfortunately the magpies come and do it in my garden quite a lot, still eggs for dinner because, you know, that's the animal kingdom, folks. And so is this a blue jay who's just had three eggs or are they returning to their nest and actually they've had the same experience happen to them? So that's an interesting one to ponder. I'm sure that the creator, of course, had a particular one in mind. Then we've got the Six of Swords, and I like this because we often see them in the boat, but in this case we've got the Mallard Duck, and they're swimming away from six leftover feathers that they no longer require. And then the Seven of Swords is the Raven, which is a very interesting one. Now, just to help you identify, you can tell very easily between raven and crow by the shape of the tail feathers. So here you can see that it comes into a particular shape. Usually ravens are a little more sort of scruffy around the neck and around the beak anyway, but I'm almost certain this is a raven just based on the tail feather shape. And then, you know, are they taking these fantastic goods with them? Or if that's not really your seven of swords interpretation, if you think about how many thoughts we're processing and how many options there are, are they actually removing some because these seem to have attached to their body? It doesn't necessarily make me think of something they'd put on themselves, but it really, you know, I don't want to sway people's interpretations too much. 
A few people had said to me that this one kind of flummoxed them, but the way that I see it is they are encased by their carrier and also this one's piercing it as well. So it's not easy for them to be removed. They're not necessarily in the situation that is favourable if you're an arrow and you want to be flying through the air. But I'm sure that, again, there's lots of ways you could read that. We've got the trippy barn owls for nine which is very interesting because they've got these very nightmarish dark dark eyes again i just think this is beautiful but i think that the creator has brought out just a slight level of creepiness that sometimes is conveyed really well and of course one of these faces but four of these faces and if you count then you get the nine and then here we've got what I think is a sparrow. Now, if it is a sparrow, this leads on really well with the page. But nevertheless, we've got a little birdie here. It's quite nice. There's no blood. It, they actually remind me more of acupuncture needles. It's like a tiny pinprick, but it doesn't look like a great situation to be in. And of course, that is very Rider Waite Smith in terms of that finality in the completion. But what's interesting, this is a little whiter and the eyes are different. So that's why I said I don't know if this is actually a sparrow. But this is, I am more certain that this is a sparrow. And it would be nice if we think of the completion of the, the Ten of Swords. And then how we take that journey. And when we're in the Page of Swords, it's not that we know nothing, because obviously we have all this existing intellect and information and experience that we've got going on. But it's more about beginning to do something with that in the sort of the conception and the seed that is the pages. And so I like to consider that transformation from the ten to the page. But... That's just me and I could be stretching the connection out a little bit. And we've got a weeny little caterpillar here, which turns into a butterfly in the Night of Plumes, which is pretty cool. You've got the arrow, we've got some more wind sort of speaking to the movement again. And someone had said that this was a great egret, so I didn't double check this one, I confess. Then we've got the queen and we've got another gorgeous butterfly and in the queen we've got the the moons are in opposites to each other from the queen and kings which is interesting and then we've got the moon and the sun in all of the king and queens in all of the courts and these ones are directional i don't know if they're all directional we'll look at that as we go through but I think that that's quite nice if you do read directions. So the Queen of Plumes is, I believe, a Victoria crowned pigeon. I have never seen one before. This was another one that I got from a blog. And then finally, we've got the Vulture for the King, who is rather grand. Oh, and one, one addition, we've got the arrowed feather pointing down here and pointing up here so lots of symbology to be read and when people say these are stark obviously they are stark in contrast to some of the very busy decks but there is symbology to be found and sometimes it takes you a few times to notice these little bits and pieces but it's really worth doing if you kind of want to get a little bit more from the deck in terms of what the creator was hoping to add to the layers. Into our cups and we've got our ace. And then we've got our two, which I'll be honest, I, I couldn't solidify it. So if you know what this is, then I'd love to know. But of course we do have the two and that kind of symbiotic nature going on and we've got the infinity symbol again for the three we've got peach blossoms which the peach kind of helps us speak to and if you think of things blossoming and the three coming together this is much more pippish as you can see 
but not Marseille of course but it's just more focused on individual aspects of the message rather than a whole scene so if you're going to find that difficult then again this is a deck that may take some time and some real commitment before you get into that natural flow with it we've got the four and this is what appears to be a dried up rosebud and in terms of the rider weight smith that works quite well because you know the flower is no longer in its in its full bloom in its glory but actually a lot can be done with this you know many of us who engage with various crafts in our practice will of course know that rose petals will be great for various spells and tinctures and many other things so here we've got five chopped down tree stumps which of course they've been taken down in all of their glory and that fits very well with the fives i think that this is possibly a lily with six eyeballs <laughs> and that's that's quite fun in itself at least it is for me if you like strange things and obscurities then you will appreciate this but yeah lily is my guess i couldn't decide on what this was so i didn't choose but again there are a lot of eyeballs in this one and this is the seven so there's a lot of there's a lot of options in this seven which again that works very well Oh, and finally, before I put it down, it's also in sevens. So we've got seven leaves here, then seven or petals rather, seven petals here, seven petals there. So we've got the seven coming through, but it's coming through more than once, which again, it kind of speaks to that, the options available and feeling maybe a bit overwhelmed by all those choices. We've got the eight with the petals no longer attached to the middle, but the middle is actually a waning crescent. We've got the nine of blooms. I want to say that I think that this is the lotus again, very similar to the one that we had hanging from the fall. So that's my guess and then it would make sense because we've got the nine here and then finally the ten where the glorious lotus has opened and I love this rainbow for that. Awesome, awesome representation. Now this one I did get help from again. I was so glad that someone found what this was. Glacius Atlanticus, maybe I... I think I'm definitely pronouncing the first part wrong, but it's got lots of nicknames and one of them is Sea Swallow, which was, it's kind of a funky looking wee little thing, but I'll put the information below and then it will help you if you want to go and look further into it. Again, we've got a lot, lot of water going on, both in the page and in the night in terms of movement for these ones. And this is a swordfish. I'm going for swordfish, I mean, look at that nose, what else could it be? <laughs> we have got a beautiful octopus for the queen, which I love. I don't see these often depicted. And as I said before, we've got both the, the moon and then we've got the sun on the king. And again, with this flower that I didn't identify. So please let me know if you know what it is. This one looks like she's in the lotus again. And the king is a, it depends again on your pronunciation. So it's either a better fish or a beta fish, depending on where you come from and how you pronounce it. And they still, whilst this one looks a little bit more forward, it still looks pretty directional to me. Onto the stones. So this is the one that gets everybody. This is the wands. And what you'll find is that in some of the ones, it's actually depicted very clearly. So it, it probably won't take you as long as you might fear. There are not really many animals or things that I need to tell you here. We can see we've got very ram-like horns in the two of wands and then two of the crystals. And again, we've got the infinity symbol, which is pulling the message of the twos together. 
we've got the three antlers for this one and we've still got three crystals this is i think i've seen this shape in at least three of my decks and i've seen them in other people's reviews of other decks as well so it's quite a common depiction for the three of wands when it's more of a pip like or a, a sort of less scenic deck and it's those three coming together and that structure and that forming but of course the the sort of window through because we see the ones on the three of the Rider Waite Smith looking out. The four for me is very four of ones. We've got these spiral like horns and we've got this celebratory thing that's joining them all. So that's what I mean. Some of these are probably going to to bring you back to the ones more than you might anticipate we've got these antlers intertwined with each other and if you think about how stags rut during those seasons in order to sometimes to win a mate sometimes to show off to see who's going to be higher up in the leadership chain and all those kind of things then if you think of deer rutting and stags rutting then again the conflict in the five makes a lot of sense in this one we've got the six which is very much that kind of crown that the person's wearing when they're holding their wand up or this it's usually a wand isn't it they don't have a sword in that one in that kind of celebratory with one we've won this round kind of thing and so that reminds me of of what they're wearing on their head immediately if that helps you we've got the seven and you can see this spiral horn kind of breaking through the crystals or as they're called here stones i never call them stones i always call them crystals but as i say they're red so whatever you call them think fire and it will bring you back to the wands and then here's the one that if all else fails what's more eight of wands than this <laughs> it's literally the eight of wands just without everything else going on so very uh, kind of what we're used to seeing we've got the nine and we're starting to feel some weight on this antler we've got all these extra growths coming off of it and that works nicely because whilst to me this is very Rider Waite Smith for those who work with numerology more and more lean towards that this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how the nines and the tens and things like that speak to you I appreciate not always we've still got the three of swords and the ten of swords but I feel like there's more leeway in this deck and then here we've got the ten which is this fabulously amazing cluster of these beautiful red crystals and again that's what i mean you could think in terms of where on earth's the antler gone this has kind of overpowered them if you want to go that way with it or you can think of this as the sheer completion of the cluster really coming together and being fully developed so we move into our cults and our page of stones i believe is a dick dick so they are dwarf antelope and they're really really cute and tiny so that's rather sweet and you can see here that their horns are replaced with these adorable crystals and we've got the crisscross in front of them then we move into the night it's an interesting one because is it a horse or is it a unicorn because if they've used the if the creators use crystals here to replace their you know the beginning of their horns then maybe that's what they're doing here because we don't have any of those on the queen because of course she wouldn't have antlers so i'm kind of going unicorn but whatever works for you horse unicorn it'll do the job and you can see that we've got the fires really sparked in this one and now the, the two crystals, they're no longer sort of confining like they are in the page, but they've actually come apart. So more movement in that capacity. And then again, both directional. Yay, we've got the queen and we've got the king. 
the sun and the moon and all of those lovely things. Now the queen is a white-tailed deer, white-tailed doe, whatever you prefer. And you can see that her crystals are kind of, I don't know, it just feels a little bit more gentle in this one. And then we've got the, we've got the big horn sheep. At least that's what I think it is. I did look at several sort of variations and the crystals, I don't know, there's something about the structure of them that feel different for me in these two cards. And finally we get into the pentacles suit, so the bones. I have identified a lot of the bones and then I've had some extra support on some of them from the blogs. Some of them I have just named the, you know, the whole joint that you're seeing. So again, I, I'm doing what I can for you guys. If it's wrong, I apologise. We've got the single bone here and I think this is the femur and I'm going to leave it out and I will tell you why. Now here we've got the two of bones and again we've got the two pieces and the infinity symbol. So the two pieces of jaw that are required to work together. I thought that this was a fox jaw, so that was my guess. Someone else had said cat, I don't know. I went fox, but I'm just letting you know what the other guess, or, you know, these, these aren't just random guesses. Of course, myself and the people who have written the blogs have done their research and we've tried as much as we can. But there's, there's definitely something about these working together. There's actually a lot of that in the bones. So for three, we can see that we've got a knee joint. I haven't named all the bones in this because I didn't feel it was relevant. You know, we just want to know what's going on. So these three bones are crucial to each other in terms of being able to successfully move and utilize our knees. This looks like a, a hind leg of an animal because, you know, this is not the shape of our knees. And I'd hedge a bet that most of these bones are animal, not people, if not all of them. But, you know, it's a hind leg, it's a knee joint, that's, that's what I've got for you. This one is a rib cage. Again, I don't know what it's a rib cage of, but for this one, it's worthwhile considering what the rib cage protects. So we've got really important organs in our rib cage. We've got our heart, our lungs. Um, and the numbers again are relevant. So we've got four parts of the rib cage here. Oh, now the five. Ouchie, ouchie, ouchie. This, I don't think it's human again, but it's a broken shoulder blade bone. So the, I think it's called the scapula. And we can see that it's got some fractures, but actually it's got some hefty breaks as well. And I can assure you that anyone who has broke their scapula or they've fractured it, any issues around there, it's quite a significant recovery period. There's a lack of movement available. And so there's a significant impairment when experiencing this. So that speaks to the five and that it's not the end, but there is an impairment. We do see those people in the in the five in the Rider Waite Smith, you know, out in the cold, and they appear to have various injuries or conditions. This one's fun. Maybe this one is human. <laughs> this is a hand, and as you can see, it's got an extra finger, which to me is a nod to the six and that kind of generosity having more than we need and being aware of that abundance and what we do with it that's how i've taken this anyway so here's the seven and it's why i left the ace out i think that these are both femur bones which is really interesting if so because here this one's completely naked so it's the Whilst the aces are all that the suit can be, they're kind of the essence of the suit. And then by the time we get to the seven, it's got all of these mushrooms growing off of it. So we can now acknowledge, look, we started here and then this happened. Not that I want mushrooms to be growing off my femur bone, but you get where I'm going with this, hopefully. Now in the eight, we've got the spine. So this is a portion of our spinal column. And this appears to be the, the part that is above the lumbar. 
so above the very lower back and it does have a name that I'm not going to attempt to pronounce but that is the spine and you can see that it's got the the eight columns all very very well structured and doing what they need to do and very well developed In the nine it's a pelvic bone and again this isn't the shape of a human's pelvic bone but it is the shape of various animals pelvic bones i didn't write any of the ones that i had guessed down but i think that there's a couple of musings in the blog but what's lovely about this pelvis bone is you can see that there's a whole sort of tiny world growing in there and it's got the mushroom and all the grass and it very much speaks of a a, a well-developed fertile environment that is doing very well and is flourishing and finally we've got the 10 and where we started out with the the few parts of the jaw in the two this one's actually a full muzzle and i think that this is possibly a wolf that's the closest muzzle that i found when looking at this but again it could be something else what we've got here is we've got the teeth complementing each other and so there's gaps which really added a layer to my concept of the tens and we talk about the tens as completion but I think completion sounds very finite and of course things continue to grow and develop and we might recycle around something and learn something again and and I guess what I get from this is still completion, but it's not perfection. So there's 10 teeth and actually we've got them filling the gaps. So they've got a, I don't know how workable this jaw is, but we've got enough teeth in this, but it's not perfect. It's not a complete set. And when we're aiming for completing something it's much more important in my eyes to be present and to experience it than to be attaining for unrealistic expectations to be trying to perfect something sometimes when things end it wasn't a perfect outcome but it was a successful one or maybe it wasn't but it was an outcome and so that's kind of what this one left me thinking in particular so here on the page we've got as you can see, their skulls, their skulls the whole way through, but they're still very thoughtfully chosen. I believe that this is a coyote skull. Some other people had said wolf skull, but coyote skulls are quite a bit more narrow in terms of various aspects to the bones and the joint layout. So I went coyote. That's my can we call it an educated guess? I don't know because it's not like I'm a skull specialist, but it wasn't just a, a random guess either. We've got the knight and it's very easy to see that this is a rhino. I actually think that I found the picture that may have inspired the artist when I was looking up the skulls because I saw this, but obviously just on its own and it was clean. But it, it, it was awesome. They're quite fascinating to look at if you're into skulls like me. It was an interesting exploration. The Queen, we've got the Sabretooth Tiger. I love that these two are included because they're both now extinct. So we've got the Woolly Mammoth for the King. But they're a really wonderful addition and they've got that kind of ancient energy to them that they've been around for a really long time which is fun for the for the queen and king i don't know if the mushrooms are supposed to add some numerical value because we've got the two here but only one here uh, and we've got the the sun and the moon and i think that that still feels quite directional so there you have it it was an interesting thing to go and add to the final cards that I wasn't aware of. And then hopefully this has been useful for those who want to go off and further their kind of study of this. You know, and, and big props and thanks to the people who created those blogs all that time ago as well. Because whilst I found some of them only halfway through, they were incredibly helpful. And they've clearly put a lot of time and effort into it as well. So this is my offering and I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm going to end up. I've got nothing else to say. I need to sit down and I will see you lovelies again soon.